The Northern Lights isn't just any old light show. In fact, it's one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Known by the scientific community as the Aurora Borealis, this phenomenon, while well documented by the scientific community, is still the subject of a lot of controversy. So today, we're going to be diving in and exploring the top 10 freaky facts about the Aurora Borealis on this episode of Super Freaky Science. To stay updated on our latest videos, don't forget to subscribe. Put simply, the aurora borealis is caused by collisions between gas particles and electrons in the magnetosphere. For those of you who don't know, the magnetosphere is the region controlled by the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the effect of aurora borealis is created when electrons transfer between their molecules upon colliding in the magnetosphere. This transfer is commonly referred to as exciting the molecule. An excited molecule eventually returns to its neutral state by releasing photons, otherwise known as light particles. When enough excited particles are releasing photons, they become bright enough to light up the night sky. Interestingly, we can thank gas particles for the beautiful colors we see during the aurora borealis. For example, the most common color, which is a yellowish green, is caused by oxygen particles about 100 kilometers above the Earth. However, a much less common color, which is a dark red, is caused by oxygen particles about 325 kilometers above the Earth. What's fascinating is that this variation also has to do with how energetically particles collide. This energeticness refers to how the excited molecules release photons in order to create light. According to Don Hampton, an assistant professor at the Poker Flat Research Range in Alaska, quote, the change in energy between excited and original states has a specific value and the resulting photon has a specific color or wavelength. Unquote. Regardless, we think this color change is pretty sweet. While the aurora borealis is usually referred to as the northern lights, it turns out that it's not the only aurora around. That's because a similar spectacle happens near the south pole. Known as the aurora australis, both look extremely similar and operate in nearly identical ways. But because the aurora australis occurs mainly in remote locations in southern Australia, New Zealand, and Argentina, they're not as popular as their northern counterparts. Either way, the aurora australis is definitely just as majestic in the South. In 1992, National Research Canada, or the NRC, and NASA created Project Centaur. Initiated to study and probe the daytime northern lights, the study was conducted in Cape Perry, which is one of Canada's northernmost outposts. Now, in order to do their research, the Centaur team sent a series of five rockets into the Aurora Borealis. After being launched, these rockets recorded 200,000 numbers per second, totaling more than 164 million pieces of information per rocket flight. That's quite the data set. This meant that the amount of information they were able to collect was astronomical, pun intended. But by far the most interesting discovery they made was related to solar wind. This solar wind is essentially the photon and electron movements that influence the light effect of the aurora borealis. With the scientists suggesting several theories about the movement of the solar wind, their findings were pretty controversial at the time. At any rate, we're just excited that these scientists are discovering all these freaky facts about the Aurora Borealis. During the American Civil War, there was a widespread belief that the Aurora Borealis was a bad omen before a battle, in particular in areas where the lights were very uncommon, such as in the southern United States. These signs were taken quite seriously. One example of such is the Battle of Fredericksburg, which occurred in Virginia in 1862. Before this battle, the soldiers wrote that the Aurora Borealis in their diaries, saying that it gave them a bad feeling. Yet, as the history books will tell you, they had to fight anyway. Now, what's interesting is that the aurora borealis can be observed even further south today, with the phenomenon being observed all the way in Atlanta, Georgia in 2011. However, thanks to the light pollution in the sky, it is almost impossible to see it with the naked eye. As a result, observing it nowadays typically involves the use of more advanced equipment. 
Although the northern lights might look like fire, their looks are deceiving. Now it's true that the temperature of the upper atmosphere can reach over a thousand degrees Celsius during the phenomenon, but its heat is based not on any sort of fire but on the average speed of the molecules. However, don't expect to feel any of that heat. Rather, the northern lights are actually quite cold. That's because the low density of the atmospheric air essentially negates this heating effect for us on Earth. Meaning that a thermometer could register temperatures far below zero where aurora borealis displays occur. Although this may seem pretty shocking, it turns out that satellites have been able to pick up clear images of aurora borealis from space. And in addition to these satellites, the International Space Station, or ISS, has its orbit flowing directly into these lights. And while we'd think that the astronauts would take this opportunity to sit and enjoy the light show, this is almost never the case. Typically this is because they're busy doing their work, so they don't really have the luxury to sit down and watch. But if there's a solar storm before the aurora borealis, that's a whole different matter. That's because these storms emit high amounts of radiation, lowering the amount of radiation around the ISS and forcing the astronauts to go into lockdown, leading to them having to huddle up in a protected area. For these astronauts, these solar storms are certainly a bit of an annoyance. The aurora borealis is not unique to Earth. In fact, many other planets have had similar lights. Most notably, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and the Hubble Space Telescope have observed the lights on Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune and documented their effects. What they noticed is that these lights differ greatly on a planet-by-planet -planet basis. For example, on Jupiter and Saturn, the lights are larger and much more powerful because their magnetic fields are much more intense than Earth's. Yet on Uranus, it is speculated that the lights are less like rings and more like single bright spots due to the planet's vertical rotation. But these three planets are exceptions, as most planets with auroras have light effects that are quite similar to the Earth's. Either way you spin it, these alternate auroras are probably pretty sweet. Although many don't know this, it turns out that the Aurora Borealis has many links to mythology. For example, the name Aurora Borealis comes from the Latin word meaning Dawn of the North, with this name being created thanks to the Romans believing that the lights were created by Aurora, who is the Roman goddess of dawn. However, some groups such as the Inuit see the Aurora Borealis much differently. They believe that the northern lights are the spirits of the animals that they've hunted, while some other indigenous groups even believe that the lights are composed of the spirits of humans that have passed. As a result, when these other groups see the aurora borealis, they interpret them as just being their ancestors paying them a visit. At any rate, each ancient culture seems to have their own mythical interpretation. I guess that's just humans for you. Interestingly enough, written recordings of the Aurora Borealis can be traced all the way back to ancient China, when in about 2600 BCE, the tale of Fu Pao was written. This story refers to the auroras as strong lightning, and even suggests that Fu Pao herself became pregnant because of the light's appearance. But the crazy thing is, there's evidence of people witnessing the aurora way earlier than that. Archaeologists have found cave paintings depicting the lights from 32,000 years ago. And since then we've seen countless other written records of the Aurora Borealis, from the ancient Egyptian King Nebuchadnezzar II's observation of them on March 12th of 567 BCE, to Galileo's description in 1570 AD. It's clear that these lights have fascinated humans for millennia. On a more recent note, thanks for watching Super Freaky Science and don't forget to subscribe.